So this channel has been known to cover characters that I think are terrible, but when I use the word terrible, that doesn't automatically mean I think they're poorly written. Granted, some characters are poorly written in my opinion, but for the most part I'm talking about their characteristics. One of the flagship comparisons I made on this channel, which people still question as to why I compared the two, was Chloe Price and Travis Touchdown. The two aren't one for one characters, but that misses the point of the comparison. In my eyes, they're both terrible characters i.e. how they're designed to be unlikable, but both have countless people that like them as characters despite their negative traits. I obviously have my preferences if you've been on this channel before, but I bring this up to talk about just because a character is terrible or does terrible things doesn't mean that they're a bad character, at least in my eyes. Rather, it falls into the writing to see if I like or dislike a character as well as their actions, which leads us to today's subject. Recently, Hell of a Boss Season 2 dropped, and while I have my own issues with the series, both from a writing and technical standpoint, I still maintain it's an entertaining and good series. The amount of people needed to create the series as well as how it's able to fight against YouTube's algorithm is something that's important to point out. Fibsy Pop has talent, and that is to be applauded. Of course, the creator isn't perfect and has a lot of controversies to her name. Granted, this isn't the video to talk about that. I'm just bringing this up so you guys know that I'm aware of this stuff. But we're focusing on the show and a character in particular. Luna. So let's start off with a question. Who is Luna? Also, I'm not gonna hold your hand on Hell of a Boss. The series is free to watch on YouTube. Every episode is out and about. You have no reason not to watch it unless you don't like this stuff. Okay, let's go. Wow, I feel so loved here. I'm gonna be frank. Luna's a bitch. I got you a little something. Is it a cure for syphilis? I... Oh. Then I don't... Happy Pride! <laughs> Of course, if you're familiar with the series, you don't need me to tell you that. She's loud, she's annoying, and much like a lot of terrible people, she's a snob at times. So, here's a question. Why do people like her? Come on. You know why. You know the kind of freaks up there who drool all over you. <clears throat> yes, well, let's sidestep that for now, and let's really consider Luna's status as a character, shall we? Honestly, if there's one thing that Vizipop is really good at, it's character design. Not only are the designs of her characters rather creative and have a unique style to them, but they also offer a lot more once you consider the setting they're in. Luna is no different in that regard. He's in Hell, the bottom ring of Hell, no less. The place where sinning human souls go. Throw in the fact that Vivsy Pop herself said on a live stream, Top of the food chain is Lucifer, and he's like the runner, you know, he's like the king <laughs> of all of it. Charlie's underneath him, because she's his heir. Underneath him is the seven deadly sins, and underneath them is the Ars Goetia, and then underneath them is the overlords. The overlords are underneath them. Then underneath the overlords are the regular sinner class, and then underneath them is the... Uh, uh, some of like the succubus and the incubus and some of the other demon classes in hell. And then on pretty the low bottom is like imps and hellhounds are like kind of the bottom of this society. Mm -hmm. Which is why uh, Helleva is about the imps because it's basically like the working class of yeah. this entire society and they have all these other classes above them. Like even the sinning class is technically above them and they have to work the retail jobs or like the, you know, whatever job in the sinner's world. They're the middle to lower class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Imps and hellhounds are on the bottom of society. Hell, there are some points where she's just referred to as a hellhound. Y'all haven't met my boss Blitz, and he's hellhound. I'm not just his hellhound. Yeah, she's my daughter. Only on paper. Now, we need to consider some interesting thoughts here, because you've got a lot of potential to really make Luna into a dynamic character. You've got a character who's on the bottom of the social food chain, so to speak. Someone who was adopted by Blitz, thus making the implication of an orphan background, and since we're in hell, it's possible that she didn't have a happy childhood. And considering that we've seen in episode 1 of season 2 of Hell of a Boss, even a character like Blitz still had more of an innocent side to him when he was younger, even having a brotherly relationship with Fizzaro. So you have the makings to show how a character becomes this way. Hell, Luna's adopted by the arguably main character of the show, and that could be leading to some interesting developments. Like, was there a specific reason Blitz chose Luna? Why does he have such strong feelings for her despite the fact that Luna is more than willing to browbeat her father, quote unquote? Is there some sort of distaste between Hellhounds and Imps, and does that play into the character itself? That's one of the strengths of Vizzy Pop's world building too. It opens up a lot of potential questions that can lead to a lot of great character moments. Granted, I don't care for some of the information being presented in materials outside the show itself, but hey, that's just something I have a problem with concerning a ton of other IPs too. So this raises the question, who is Luna and why is she like this?
Okay, she didn't do anything wrong. Now before I continue with this video, I need to make it clear by the time you're watching this, that depending on how quick I can make the assets and how fast my editor is, I'm working on it. it's possible that my complaints will be answered. Whether or not that's the case, time will tell, but these things can still be applied to the first season. So, Luna, you've got a ton of potential, tons of questions, and obvious fur bait that has drawn the attention of a lot of people, don't deny it. Shut up, dear furry! But the problem is that up to this point, we barely have anything to go off of with her. There's hardly anything to her backstory outside the occasional glimpse here and there. And that's really the biggest problem I have. Hell, the fact that Luna's position as Blitz's adopted daughter and co-worker for the M's should involve a lot more development for her. Foxy, stop shaking! You're gonna shoot our only hail ham. Wow. I feel so loved here. Now, that's a joke, but considering other aspects in the show as well as how Luna gets referred to as just a hellhound later in the season, I have no doubt that it's going to come up in the series in Season 2. But Season 1 doesn't do anything with it. Luna is a flat character in there. Now, I do intend on talking about Episode 3 and 6, since I know for a fact that people are furiously typing in the comments to defend Luna, but before that, I need to talk about character development and the types of development that there are. This isn't a be-all, end-all, but typically characters tend to fall into five different broad types in writing. Dynamic, round, static, stock, and symbolic. To give a brief overview of what these character types are like so you can follow my logic going forward, dynamic characters are ones that change over the course of a story. Round is a major character that shows changes and has the ability to change from the moment we meet them. Static is a character that doesn't change all that much over the course of the story. Stock is a character with fixed personality traits, and symbolic is when a character represents a theme or concept more than themselves. Now that I've brought this up, let's talk about episode 3. I won't be explaining the full plot, but notes are that Luna gets a crush on a new hellhound, Vortex. Vortex works for Blitz's ex, Verosica, and hijinks ensue. It's a premise with potential, and this is the first time that we as the audience see Luna in a different light. And not just the human form of her. We see her feeling and emotion outside of just being an angst bitch. Hell, we even get this line. Oh yeah? I wish I had friends. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't, I, 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 I don't have friends. But nothing really comes from it. Like, a line like that should cause some sort of realization for the character, but nope, nothing. Now, you can say I'm being nitpicky, and fair enough, it wouldn't be the first time I was reading too much into smaller things, and how something like that could shoot me in the back simply because I stayed. Again. But I would argue that this could have been used for character development, even on the smallest of levels. I mean, if people are willing to take even the smallest aspects of a show and roll with it, why not lines like this? Especially if it could be used to craft development for the characters. However, you want to know what isn't character development? Learning that Luna can express other emotions other than bitchiness. That is not development, that's expanding the character, and there is a difference. Development has the character grow from an action, and then expanding the character just shows they have more to them than just their initial character traits. To make it easy to understand, it's like thinking a character who likes coffee also enjoys boba tea. That's just learning more about the character, not the character growing or developing from the events in the story. Just because we learn more information about a character, that doesn't equate to the character gaining development. Now let's get to a more murkier example. Fuck Blitz! Why can't you stay out of my face for like five minutes? Because I adopted you! And that should mean something! Oh, what does it matter? You're not my real dad! I was almost 18! It still counts! Well, it shouldn't! I didn't need you then, asshole! I don't now! I'd argue that this isn't development either. This is more or less providing information about Luna and Blitz's relationship. And we also learned this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, Blitz? I'm... Enjoy your break, Looney. I'm gonna go kill something. Uh... Damn, girl, that was savage. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. He'll get over it. He always does. Now, this can be argued to be development in the making since Luna is feeling negative emotions in how she treated Blitz, but considering he'll get over it, he always does, it makes it seem like this is something that has happened before, obviously by the wording, and something that Luna hasn't really grown from. Now, this is totally something that you consider to be based on interpretation, as I can see people saying that Luna did grow from this point. We've seen in preview of Season 2 that there seems to be more going on between the adoptive father and daughter dynamic. But to me, we don't really see Luna change after this episode, at least not in a notable way. Now, a good counter-argument is in Episode 6, where she protects the Grim War and is willing to go Blitzkrieg mode to help protect Blitz. Then again, that's more in line for an episodic show. Most of the episodes are in a vacuum, at least until Season 1 finale and Season 2's opener. And while there is a plotline, I'd be arguing if it didn't feel like the characters didn't float around every once in a while and lack development. To make it clear, I'm not saying that expanding on a character is a bad thing. Being able to learn more information about a character is good. 
As stated before though, information such as Luna saying she doesn't have friends or that she and Blitz are getting into arguments are things that expand upon the character, and more information on that character is good. But we don't have the why. That's the biggest issue. Why is this character like this? Why is Luna a bitch? Why is Blitz fawning over Luna? And to make it clear, I don't hate Luna as a character. She's got a lot of entertaining moments. <laughs> Okay, I'm here. But most of what we got is preparation for development, meaning there's a good chance that the character is going to get development that I want her to get. It's the rub of talking about an ongoing series that your criticisms can be negated or confirmed beforehand, but there are still criticisms that can be levied. Don't panic, Moxie! I'm not panicking, because hellquakes don't happen. Stop getting hysterical, fatty! <laughs> However, the biggest issue is motivation, and a lack of reason to why Luna is the way she is. Again, I admit that it's possible at the time of me writing this, we could get an episode immediately that slaps my entire video's issues into the dirt. And hey, if that does happen, then I'll actually be happy with that. But let's continue with this section. Let's consider Luna's treatment of Moxie. Fucking be riding, this is fucking beautiful. Clearly there's something going on, and I'm not hating on Luna for treating Moxie terribly. I've seen a few people say that's why they dislike her, and hey, fair enough. But again... Why does she hate him? Is there something going on between imps and hellhounds? I don't know! Granted, a lot of the show's focus is on the imps and Stoles. Lots of owl demon. Mmm. No, permission not granted. It's why I consider Luna to fall into the camp of static character with slight chances of a round character in the mix. She's a character that hasn't really gotten a chance to grow, and for a character that's in the main group, I think that's kind of sad. Then again, you can say the same thing about Millie. Millie's a good character, and as a couple with Moxie, it's a fun time. However, there have been times that Millie gets sidelined in order to make Moxie look better. Actually, that's a good thing to bring up right now. So if there's one established character trait amongst the group of Imp, it's that Millie and Luna don't like each other that much. Most of it stems from how Luna treats Moxie like garbage, with the possibility of prejudice being between Imps and Hellhounds being a factor there. The only reason you have a wife is because you're easy to manage. No, he's not, you bitch! So the two characters don't like each other, and that's pretty much a good character dynamic right there. And we get to episode 6, where Blitz and Moxie get captured by the agents. Luna and Millie need to work together, putting aside their differences in order to save them. This is actually a very common trope, where two characters who have been known to be at best incompatible with each other, or at worst for enemies, will put aside their differences in order to succeed on something. Albeit at times it's not so easy to do, but the characters will often put aside their differences after a little struggling and allow the two to co-op with each other for victory. It's an older trope, and one that's very clearly effective, allowing characters who hate each other or such learn a bit more about each other, and sometimes become even a little bit closer in the process. Hell, even getting a mutual respect for each other, even if it's small. That's something I really want to see with this episode, and by doing so, you could have given both Luna and Millie some development. And while they still could dislike each other, and Luna could still be a shit to Moxie, there could have at least been some level of respect given to each other. You're pretty agile for an old lady. I'm like five years older than you. Hell, for the show that represents relationships between characters, there really isn't one between the two of the female leads in the show. We barely get anything between the two, and we could have seen them struggle, learning more about each other, and possibly get more insight into why they hate each other. Instead, most of the episode is just showing how badass the group is with more character development given to Blitz and Moxie, which is fine, but I still maintain it's a missed opportunity. Granted, what I'm saying here is basically nothing more than fluff, since to a lot of people, they just like Luna. Come on, you know why. Hell, a lot of people just like how the characters are. I don't mean to come off as downplaying the development that is in the show already, but I see missed potential and opportunity to make the rest of the cast shine. And hey, I like Luna too. I'd be lying if I said she was completely a flat character, because Luna isn't. Luna has a bit of characterization. If you take the pilot, for example, she's the one in contact with the client. She gets mad when she learns the imps have been going to the human world without disguises, and still follows Blitz's orders in episode 6 to prevent things from getting worse. And hey, Luna does come to help Blitz and Moxie when they're fighting Stryker. Kinda makes things worse, but hey, the fact she even showed up is amazing. Luna has potential, but at the moment, that's all it is. Potential. The biggest issues are her past as well as her lack of development. There's a lot of potential in both those to make Luna really into a stellar character outside her wicked design and overall bitchy attitude that draws people to her. And maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit too soon, but hey, content is content. <laughs> So, what's the point of this video? Well, aside from giving my editor a paycheck, I do honestly like Luna as a character, but all I can really say is I like her design as a character, not what makes her into a character. As I've been saying throughout the video, there's a chance that maybe real soon that we'll have more development and explanation for Luna's past. I want to see that potential fulfilled, though. 
because, hey, Luna's got a lot of interesting materials to work with, and she's got a large amount of fan base that may or may not be raising their pitchforks at me for this video as I speak this right now. Shut it! Oh well, I guess we'll find out soon enough. <laughs> Bitches. So the last time we talked about Luna from Hell of the Boss, and how the biggest issue I had with the character was that she lacked the actual development that was being made, and how she was, at the time of me making the analysis, a flat character. And the reaction to that video was... We're in the money, we're in the money, we've got a lot of what it takes to get along. Not what I was expecting. Hence, I figured that we'd keep this up and talk about a character that I briefly mentioned in that video and expand upon my analysis with said character while Season 2 is being made and give my hopes for it. That character is... Millie. Honestly, Millie's development throughout the series so far is actually kind of worse than Luna's. At least Luna had an episode that was at least halfway on her as a character and as such and planted the seeds of development. I can barely say the same about Millie. Also, before we get any further, there were a few people who wanted me to talk about Octavia, as well as the sneak peek that potentially has her and Luna interacting because the fan base of the show apparently wants two goth girls hanging out. Can't say I don't blame them. Look, guys. I dig goth chicks too, but I can't really come up with anything worthwhile to talk about with Octavia until that episode comes out because Octavia only really has one episode and a couple appearances afterwards. I can't really discuss too much on development until we see the character. Acting like a character. Way to go, Common, you tanked your watch time. Who are we talking about again? Oh yeah, Millie. So, Millie, the third member of the IMP field agents and wife of Moxie. My wife! Look, let's get this out of the way. Despite the name of the video, Millie is not a terrible character. Sure, she can be loud, she kills people, and can be confrontational, but that's not a complaint. I'm a guy who loves characters like Travis Touchdown, and he's all those things as well in the first game. Fuckhead! Millie is almost a balanced character, really. While she has her serious side, she also has her kinder side, too, and that's in regards to her husband, Moxie. The two are pretty cute with each other, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only who thinks that. Hell, the music video of the two of them has over 15 million views. People like their ships. Mmm, damn do they like their ships. Damn it. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a power couple in a show like this. Heck, it's actually a good thing when you think about it, since it has a lot of potential to have both characters stand out amongst the cast, and may even act as a parallel to other relationships that are shown throughout it. <laughs> Wait, you? Yeah! Hell, you can even compare it to the other main relationship that I just made a crack about, and YouTube doesn't want me referencing for some damn reason because they keep demonetizing me for- But that doesn't happen in the show, at least not in season one. In fact, it's quite different really, where the relationship that they have is actually being shunned and ridiculed in the final episode of season one. I love you, I love you. <laughs> now, I get it. We're on Twitter. Now, I get it. We're in hell. Sorry, easy to mix the two up nowadays. But I shouldn't expect the Ring of Lust to be all about the sanctity of marriage. But what I would like is an explanation of the culture and how things work in hell. Yes, I know this is a video about Millie, but this is important, damn it! And I'm leading up to something. Much how, like I explained in the Luna video, we've got a lot of questions of how things work. Stuff like how hellhounds and imps are the lower class, and how there could have been some sort of prejudice between the two, and getting back to the Ring of Lust, how and why marriage and love are frowned upon. Especially when earlier in the season we saw Millie's parents who are well, I assume they're married. Is marriage and good old-fashioned romance frowned upon in the world of sin? Or is it just a bunch of jackasses who just want to have crazy one-nighters? I don't know. I know I brought this up before, but one of the bigger issues I have with Hell of a Boss is the world building. Like, I got lucky with a podcast of Vivzy talking about the ranking system and stumbled across a couple of users on Twitter talking about it while doing research. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how this works. No one should be expected to comb through the internet to find information that should be in the series. Podcasts, tweets, live streams. Hell, online comics too. It's fine if it's to flesh out the elements of a show and expand upon the concept. Cause you don't want to bog down your audience with lectures telling them about the working class. Cause that's not entertaining. But you should at least establish some of these concepts in your show. Now, you may be wondering, Common, what does this have to do with Millie? I'm glad I asked myself that. Characters don't exist in a vacuum. When you're writing a story, you need to consider the world as well, since it too is a character. Much like how the people in the real world can be affected by the world of it or affected, so do fictional characters. 
Duh. Let's get back to the podcast that had Vivzy Pop talking about the class system. Pretty the low bottom is like imps and hellhounds are like kind of the bottom of this society, mm. which is why uh, Helleva is about the imps because it's basically like the working class of yeah. this entire society and they have all these other classes above them. Like even the sinning class is technically above them and they have to work the retail jobs or like the, you know, whatever job in the sinner's world. They're the middle to lower class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. Groovy. Things that make me sound like an old man. This is word of God. Let's take this as fact. How does this affect our characters? More specifically, Millie, because I know there's going to be people who are going to bring up Blitz and Stolas, but that's for another video, maybe. I don't know. Nice. What I'm saying is the world needs to interact with the characters, and we really haven't gotten too much development on the world and how it really affects our characters. Like, one of the biggest issues I have is how barren the world of hell the boss is when you just view the show. Like, there's a lot of stuff that isn't explained, and not everything has to be, but it would be helpful if stuff like the working class, or how the ranking system works, or how the circles of hell work, would be nice to see. Grant, I'd say a halfway decent counter to that is that it would take too much time to make that happen or bog down the episodes. Or you could even say that the relationship between Stolos and Blitz actively shows that with the working class and the elites. And I would counter that there tends to be a bit too much fluff as well as having development being made that could be considered redundant. Moxie's development to be specific, but we'll get to that later. Now, I bring this up because this is a bit of an issue for all characters. We get the untold story of why the culture is affecting our characters, but there's no actual confirmation within the show itself. Now, this is a criticism you can levy at every character in Hell of a Boss. Hell, I specifically don't know what the owl demons do, the Goetia. Hey boss, I think the real pronunciation is- Yeah, 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 whatever. So, now now that we've got that out of the way, let's actually talk about Millie. I probably should have used this earlier, huh? <laughs> I love you, honey. But for fuck's sake. <laughs> I will not be the first person to say this, and I probably won't be the last, but my biggest issue with Millie as a character is that she's, well, flat. Oh. No, not that way. She's a flat character. Like, pretty much the only things that to her is that she's a kick buck married chick that loves her husband very much, can fight, and has a family that's southern. Like, it's not bad, but when you really think about it, there's nothing really there for development. But let me rephrase that. There hasn't been an episode dedicated her to really flesh her out. And blah blah blah, people typing in the comments that's saying, Oh, season two can flesh her out. Yeah, but we're in a here and now, and this can still be applied to the first season's faults. Hell, a lot of what I say about Luna can also be applied to Millie's character, too. What we've seen from the imps in the show, they ain't exactly the most upstanding citizens, yet Moxie and Millie tend to be a little bit better. Well, they aren't what I would call good, since they do kill people, but there's obviously a lot more positivity going on between the two. So, here's a good question. How did Moxie and Millie meet? What drew Millie to Moxie? Like, we get some of her backstory in Lulu Land, where we learn that she's quite violent in Harvest Moon episode. Yeah! Play. Millie, you know you get too carried away. The last competition ended in 15 separate funerals. I'm aware, but I only caused nine of them. How come Sally Mae still gets to compete? Your sister doesn't have a neighborhood head count. She so does. It doesn't count if they don't find the body. We also learned that she's been married to Moxie for about a year in Ozzy's episode. Again though, this is not development of a character, this is expanding upon the character and their backstory. And there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle that are scared about, but missing at this point. From what I can gather, from what fragments of Millie's past and current actions, she's not shabby with fighting and can arguably be one of the most competent fighters on the IMP team. And has a violent streak. And can kick people's asses. And while she hasn't lost her touch, the fact that she's able to be so lovey-dovey with Moxie flies in the face of that violent streak, showing that she's got a soft spot. And the episode when Blitz and Moxie are being held captive by the agents, we see her being extremely violent and competent, as well as seeing her being sad. So, there's material to work with here, but it's a bit murky at this point, and hasn't really been used at all in the first season. I'm not gonna rehash my complaints with episode 6 like I did with my Luna video, which, if you want a refresher, chance to have Luna and Melee bounce off each other, argue learn more about each other, and then develop a mutual respect, blah blah blah, show my video here. I will still maintain that it's a missed opportunity. But then we get to the bigger issue, episode 5. So here's what we can consider. We're in Millie's hometown, we can see her family, we learn a bit more about Millie's past, and can even see a bit of her family dynamic, as well as how her family is worried about her. Oh, and uh, we also get this. <laughs> Pathetic. <laughs> Ha! <laughs> 
Holy shit! Kind of reports that whole violent streak and possibly more killer attitude going on. However, the episode quickly turns into a Moxie episode where he has to prove himself to Millie's family and then turn a bit of a Blitz episode at the end with Stryker trying to seduce him. Ooh, kinky. You need to be stuck! I, I think what I kind of find infuriating is that this was a good opportunity to flesh out Millie as a character and maybe reinforce the confidence that Moxie had gotten early in the season, but no, gotta rehash the character development. I know someone's gonna say that Moxie's original development was, you know, making sure he was capable of killing innocent people, but he really wasn't. <laughs> to me, it was more of a confidence issue going on, and while I can admit that, hey, that's fine, confidence is something that you need, but it's still kind of rehashing, if you ask me. I think what I want to see is actually have Millie be her own person. Like, as it stands, she's a wife character with a violent tendency, but that's all there really is to her other than her southern accent, which as someone who's been living with people with that accent for ages, I'm kind of biased against that. The only for the lack of development for Millie is to actually see her interact with others without Moxie. Or hell, I'd be fine to see how the two actually met. Millie is borderline psychopathic with her violent tendencies, so to see how that change was made would be a very fun idea. It is perfectly fine to have a pair of characters in an established relationship, but the problem is that Moxie and Millie don't have equal development and are more in line with the main cast. Like, if Blitz is to be the main character of the show, Moxie and Millie are the primary characters due to how often they show up in the show and story. However, they are not equal in that regard. Moxie is the one who gets more of the development, and unfortunately that makes Millie into a secondary support character. If I really had to put it down, Blitz is the main character, Moxie is the secondary protagonist, and unfortunately Millie has become a support character, which sucks because it's clear that the show doesn't want her to be because of all the badass moments she has. But from a writing perspective, there's a lot to be desired. What was sex with her like? Billy! What? It's a pop star! You'd want to know what sex with Michael Crawford was like! It needs to be stressed that a lot of my complaints with these characters, they are dependent on how the second season will go. Much like how there could be an episode that expands upon Luna's character and in interaction with other characters and give her development, the same could be said of Millie. From what we've seen, however, I'd say that Luna's got a better shot since there's more prominent seeds of development being planted, but Millie's got a bit more speculation to her that makes it harder for me to see how they could improve upon her lack of development or full characterization from Season 1. Harder, but not impossible, mind you. Frankly, if you were to ask me, they should focus on the violent tendencies that were established in the first season and work with that along with the relationship that she has with Moxie. I mean, Millie comes from the Ring of Wrath, and that should be capitalized and explored upon. Hell, look towards Season 2's first episode, and you can already see the show is exploring the past of their characters through flashbacks. And while I'm not too big on flashbacks, especially if they're done a lot, which, God, I hope they don't do for that season, if it's done in the service of characters and learning how they develop, I am perfectly fine with that. If I can make a prediction of sorts, I'm willing to bet that there's going to be an episode dedicated to Millie, we'll probably see her past as a violent assassin or fighter or something like that, and possibly see how she met Moxie. That's a hazard of a guess, though. It's probably something that's got to do with killing, since Moxie said that's what he loves about her. Ya freak. If I were to really take into consideration the information that we do have on Millie, that'd probably be the best route to take with the writing and to remain consistent with the pre-established lore of the character. To make another thing clear, there should be more interactions between Millie and other characters while Moxie isn't around. Then again, I'm just making a suggestion in what I want there to be. That doesn't mean it's an actual criticism, just a little hope. Again, my complaints with the Dorks episode kind of elicits that. Millie should be her own character outside being a wife and an employee. She's probably the character with the third most screen time and voice lines in the show, so you should at the very least have more for the character and not rely too much on fluff and already established self-conscious issues of another character. Honestly, one of the biggest criticisms of my Luna video, and one that I actively addressed in said video, was that there's gonna be an episode dedicated to the character, and thus my issues with Luna are negated. And the same can be said about Millie. And hey, fair enough. I would argue that misses the major point of my videos though, and that is to showcase how unfair the character environment has been divided amongst the cast up until now and to showcase what seeds there are, and to see if they'll actually come to fruition during the second season. If anything, Hell of a Boss is more focused on the relationship of Blitz and Stolas, with the extra side of Moxie, with Luna and Millie being left to the side. Now, you can say till you're blue in the face, but these are issues that should be brought up and remembered if and when the payoff for this development is there, so we can see if it's possible to see if it's consistent. Then again, I'm not gonna say that if it doesn't, then hey, it's bad. 
Who knows? You don't have to do what I say. I'm just a critic online who just likes sharing his opinion. Nothing I say is fact. I will say in the case of Millie, I believe that it was a bad thing not to give her any actual development in the first season. There were a lot of good opportunities for that. Of course, there's one thing I can really say that stems from a lot of issues with the show, and it's apparently one of the best things that people enjoy about said show. But if you guys want me to talk about that, then hey, let me know. How? Well, if we can get over 5,000 likes and you guys type in Lululand in the comments, well, we'll see how well that goes for me. Until next time, I'm Manga Common and have a good day. However, they are not equal in that regard. Moxie is the one who gets most of the development between the two, and unfortunately, Millie makes more... It's fine to have a pair of characters that are in established marriage, but the problem is that Moxie and Millie don't have it of equal development. It is fine to have a pair of characters that are in established marriage, but the problem is that Moxie and Millie don't really have a... However, they are not equal in that regard. Moxie is the one who gets the more development, and unfortunately makes Millie into a more secondary... <laughs> you know, if you want, you can put a blooper reel at the end of this video. Well, I'm not looking forward to making this video, but here we go. I made a promise that when the Millie video hit 5k likes, I'd talk about Hell of a Boss again. Don't you people have jobs? And it'd be a topic that I'm a little hesitant to talk about. And that'd be the main relationship and one of the biggest hooks of the show, Stolas and Blitz. Oh god, it was one time! Now, I'm an old fossil who's grown up on the internet. I've seen the perils of shipping and actual relationships and fandoms, and if you dare criticize them in any capacity, you run the risk of unleashing the floodgates. But if you've been on this channel for any time, you should know that I'm no stranger to getting under the skin of fandoms to the point where they have to slander and lie about what I actually believe, and are too lazy to pay attention to what I actually said in the videos too. I understand that I can be quite long-winded at times, it can be even be considered a windbag, but that doesn't mean it's right to lie about a person based upon an assumption. So we're almost done with me raising the shields, and I want to point something out important, and that's that any issues I have with said relationship aren't because it's between two guys. There's always going to be that one person who's going to come along and accuse me of disliking the relationship because of that factor, which... No, not only am I for various kinds of relationships in the media, the only complaint about the relationship in this regard that I have is that Stolitz doesn't do it for me, because they're two skinny twig boys that just don't do it. I've got a type I know I like. <laughs> And to make it clear, not that it's any of your guys' business, since I don't normally like talking about my personal life on my channel or social media, I consider myself to be bi. You did it, good so job. I can't believe it, I'm proud of you. Because apparently, cishets can't review the show. There, have some common lore. Now let's get to the actual video. Oh shit! <laughs> Sorry, I fucked your husband. <laughs> Hey boys and girls, it's that time where Common has to do some explaining! Yippee! Talking about terrible characters on my channel has become a bit of a staple, especially in recent years, and for good reason. I believe that terrible characters can be a bit of a touchy subject, and like how some of them can be very entertaining, and others can make me lose my lunch over them. After some thought, I think it really comes down to what the story is trying to do with the characters that really makes me think whether or not a terrible character is a badly written character. There's also the fact of context of the story as well. Take for example a character like, say... Senator Stephen Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising, who's clearly a terrible person with warped goals and is all for scooping kids' brains out and putting them in a cybernetic body. I mean, that's clearly a terrible person, and yet a lot of people, myself included, like him. As a boss, as a villain, as a character, and honestly it's because of moments like this. <sighs> It's a small moment, but it's those moments that can really make a character more admirable, even if they're terrible people. Stolas and Blitz, while both being terrible people, make sense considering that they're demons, so of course they'd be dicks. And hey, they, like Armstrong, have moments of levity that shine through their terrible personalities. Whether it be through the flashbacks with Stolas singing to a younger Octavia, or Blitz being... well... 
Not a jackass. There are moments that show that these characters are, for lack of a better term, human. Yes, they are extremely flawed. Yes, they do terrible things, but that doesn't mean that a character can't be liked in that regard. I will say, though, the show does make things a little hard for me to actually like these two as characters on their own. I get it. Stolas is a sexy, tall, owl man who wants to suck imp Cock? but when we got to the second episode there was just something off that rubbed me the wrong way that i couldn't really put in words at the time when i made my review of it and now that i've managed to flex my mind muscles a little bit here and there i figured i'd give a crack as to what i mean yes the flashback to stolas singing to octavia is a beautiful scene i'm not gonna argue that but what i will argue is that the next portions of the episode really undercut it to me especially when you consider the reason for the episode is for stolas to make up to his daughter and if you're not familiar this is due to the follow-up that stolas cheated on his wife Stella with Blitz. So Stolas intends on trying to make things up with his daughter by taking her to Lululand. Lululand! Shut the fuck up! And hey, that's good. It reinforced that Stolas, while obviously flawed for cheating on his wife with an imp, does at the very least want to do good by his daughter. Then this happens! People want our money and our bodies. Oh, money maybe. Speak for yourself, princess. Now, I'm calling the only man who can f*** me. What? <laughs> Yeah, Stolas hires the same guy who he boned and cheated with to be their bodyguard. And when in the park, flirts with Blitz right in front of Octavia. And to be fair, the show does call out this behavior, but it still left a very bad taste in my mouth. And while Stolas stumbling over to find the right words to comfort his daughter is a heartwarming scene, it doesn't really address the cheating aspect and the fact that he has flirting with the person who caused the distress in the first place in front of his daughter. It doesn't address the fear and anxiety of losing your home and parents can really do and how the father's actions can really affect the child. There's elements of levity that can really help with understanding a character, especially one who does terrible things, but at the same time there shouldn't be kneecapping like this that undercuts the likability factor. I can understand that Stolas wouldn't have the right words to talk about this sort of thing with his daughter. That's perfectly fine. Of course, there are other interpretations to consider, such as Stolas knowing what he did was wrong and just couldn't find a way to justify it to his daughter. But bringing the guy who you banged and flirting with him during your time when you're trying to make things up with your daughter? I'm sorry, that either tarnishes the aspect of Stolas trying to be a good father, or it makes him out to be an idiot who can't read social cues, or changes to make sure his daughter is comfortable. And Blitz? Ugh. Mmm. Well, this is probably going to get me shot in an alleyway, but I am not the biggest fan of Blitz. I honestly think he's got a few too many dislikable traits for me to personally like him. I understand there's a good number of people who do like him though. Blitz is a very complex character with a rough exterior to him. He's immature, he's a homewrecker, he's a thief pretty much stalks employees. Like, there's a lot to dislike about Blitz to the point where I saw his breakdown at the end of the season. I really didn't feel for his emotional breakdown. Either that or I've been broken down so much that I've become an emotionless machine. Now, I need to qualify that this is just my opinion on the character. And I'm not saying I don't understand why people don't like the guy. Blitz honestly has some of the better jokes throughout the series. And there are times where he genuinely does show care and respect to his friends and employees. Then there's the scene where we see Blitz's exes, which were slowly being confirmed that Blitz sabotaged the relationship relationships, whether for selfish reasons or for the fear of being rejected. He leaves before people can leave him. That's the rut with these kinds of characters though, and sometimes that our own personal tastes and experiences can shape our tolerance for this type of character. And I'm not gonna lie, I obviously have a bias here. I'm sure that people are gonna bring up my previous Armstrong comparison, and I do want to explain why I think a character who does cause World War 3 is a bit more likable than an imp who kills people and, well... Sorry, I fucked your husband! And that's mainly because Armstrong is a villain, an antagonist, and not the main character like how Blitz is. It's a small difference, but one that I feel makes a world of difference to me. Plus, you do actually get to kill Armstrong in the end, so his bad actions do come back to punish him. Meanwhile for Blitz? Well, he does get karmic retribution at the end of the season, but it's more or less framed in a sympathetic manner, which I've already said is not something that I felt sympathy for. Now, obviously, I'm speaking just for myself, which this has been an opinion piece the entire time, don't get that wrong. I don't know what you're expecting since a lot of this is up to interpretation, and aside from stating what actually happens in the show, that's going to be an opinion. So let's get this out of the way. If you enjoy Blitz as a character, that's perfectly fine. No shame to you, but realize not everyone shares the same taste. Still, I go through this as we discuss these two characters going forward with their relationship. I felt it should be stated how I personally feel about the characters so you guys can see how I view them in a condensed manner. I also want to let you know that I don't view my opinion as the objective truth as much as I would like that to be the arbiter of truth. That ain't gonna happen anytime soon. I'm a flawed guy. I know it. You know it. Everyone who dislikes this video knows it. Everyone does. And with that, let's get to the next part. 
Octavia's with her mother this weekend, so we could. I'm not fucking you tonight, okay? I'm really just... I'm really not in the mood, Stolas. I feel like the scene really represents how this relationship actually is. There's a lot of people who do like these two being together, but I feel like there's a bit of a misconception. There's a difference between lust and love, and as someone who's been in a few relationships and a long-standing one currently, the difference between love and lust is a mutual respect. If we watch the show from beginning to end, we can see that Blitz has a great deal of disgust to Stolas's verbal come-ons. What? Why, hello, my big dick Blitzy. <laughs> What the fuck? Dad! Language, everyone! And over the course of the series, we see Blitz slowly becoming more desensitized to the solicitations, but there's still a very big power imbalance. Obviously, to me, it's one of the themes of the show, or at least attempts to show how the working class is ruled by the upper crust. It's obvious that Stolas has the power in the relationship. Aside from him being a literal hellspawn that can warp into a monstrous form, I mean. Obviously, there's a reason for the power imbalance. Now, if it wasn't for Stolas' book that Blitz stole, he wouldn't be able to run his business or provide for his employees or his daughter. Therefore, there's this swinging axe that is slowly coming closer and closer to the back of Blitz's neck. And at any moment, the book could be taken away. So, to placate the owl, Blitz does the one thing that he can do in order to maintain his current position. Submission. And this behavior also bleeds into the other bonds that Blitz has, like how he has clear envy for Moxie and Millie's relationship. Are you fucking filming us right now? I mean, it's really pushed to a very uncomfortable level where we see... Blitz, you're such a good boss. Yeah, I really want you, sir. Me too. Let's three-way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or how he has a tendency to overprotect Luna and thus preventing her from making any relationships outside of work. Like, we've got this line, remember? Oh yeah? I wish I had friends. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't, I, 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 I don't have friends. Now, while I may not like Blitz as a character, this is an interesting viewpoint on relationships. I'm no stranger to the relationships that aren't all that healthy, both in fictional sense and, uh, unfortunately, actual real life experience too. I've got some scars to prove that. But we'll keep most of my personal life out of this and remain with the fictional examples. What we've got here is essentially an exploitive, toxic relationship between the two characters. Both Stolas and Blitz get something out of the relationship, with Stolas being the one in power. Blitz gets the ability to run his business by using the book he stole from Stolas, and Stolas gets to use Blitz as a sexual outlet and plaything to escape his own tormented life, and mistook that as an actual form of love. I'm at least glad that the show points this out as a bad thing, since, yeah, this is a toxic relationship, and in my experience, a lot of toxic relationships in the media aren't actually painted out to be toxic. It's clear that what Stolas does to Blitz makes the imp uncomfortable. Granted, I feel like sometimes the message gets a little messy up like in episode 6 where we see Blitz's feelings of being trapped by Stolas and the episode caps it off with this. Alright, but you're keeping quiet or I'm using those bear traps. Oh, please do. Viv, I think you're sending me mixed messages here. Now, I'm no guru of love here, baby. But this to me is sending up a few different signals. Like, it's fine if you guys are into this sort of thing, but this is a toxic relationship, and even the show acknowledges it in its imagery and even in the final episode of season one addresses it. Solus, don't act like what we have is anything but you wanting me to fuck you, okay? You make that really clear all the time. But I just, I, I can't do it tonight, okay? You can like this sort of thing, and I can admit this is probably my interpretation of said events in the show. Nothing I say here is fact. But I feel like you can't really ignore the signs that the show is putting out there for you. And I'm not gonna sit here and judge people for liking a toxic fictional relationship. It's fiction! And if I can like fictional characters who do terrible things, then there's nothing wrong with liking toxic relationships that's fictional. It'd be hypocritical for me to demonize people for liking it. I just want people to not ignore the red flags that are showing up in your face about how this is a terrible thing. So now that I've got my thoughts out there, I think it's appropriate that we talk about the latest episode of the time of me writing this script, The Circus. If you go on YouTube, it's needless to say, but the episode is a fair bit polarizing if you take a search down YouTube lane. You've got people who are saying it drastically hurt the series, and people who like it, and think it's the best episode. You know, average day on the internet. Either way, I'm pinning a target on my back by talking about it, so here we go, boys and girls. Ah! 
I bring up this episode because it's an important episode concerning Blitz and Stolas since we learned that for one day, 25 years ago, Blitz was sold to be Stolas' friend. Or, you know, slavery. We'll talk about this later, but I kind of want to give my general thoughts on the episode itself. I tend to lean that the episode brings a few problems to the table for Hell of a Boss. One example is... I tried so many years to make it comfortable for us to have this family, but it was never enough. The only reason I have endured your constant insults and cruelty was for that girl to have a normal life. Like, from a writing perspective, this is telling, not showing. At best, we've got a painting that shows Stolas and Stella with a younger Octavia smiling. But we never got any actual scenes of Stolas trying to actually make things comfortable for his family. Hell, aside from this episode, there was one or two times beforehand that Stolas actually had a conversation with Stella on the screen, of course. I can understand have a little sympathy for Stolas' situation, obviously, but it would have been a lot stronger to have a scene or two dedicated to Stolas attempting to make his family happy and maybe have Stella sniping at him during it. It actually make this scene. What do you think the rest of the Goetia family will think? And Drelf is- I don't care what your arrogant brother thinks. And the only thing the Goetia family wanted from our marriage is already 17, so it's over. I'm done. A hell of a lot stronger, in my opinion. I know that a lot of people at this point will dismiss my criticisms as it's a comedy show, don't take it too seriously. And to that end, I'd like to retort that the show covers a lot of heavy themes. Toxic relationships, isolation, abuse, murder, self-confidence, yada yada yada. And even if it's still a comedy at heart, the show still has its moments of seriousness. The scene I just referenced is one of them. I feel like I need to explain that shrugging off criticisms from a comedy is not exactly a good defense. Just because something is a comedy, that doesn't suddenly mean it's not above criticism. Because comedy, much like serious writing, it can have its flaws. In addition, comedic writing actually requires more attention to detail because if done wrong, a joke can be greatly mistranslated and be taken seriously, and thus provide a meaning that you didn't mean to when you made it. So, just saying, it's a comedy, don't take it seriously, actively hurts the serious scenes in the show, cause you're telling me that those scenes should not be taken seriously despite everything else in the show telling me otherwise. Getting back to the main point of this segment, there's a bit of an issue that I have that really leaves a bit of a nasty taste in my mouth. Like, we've established throughout the series and in this video that Stolas has the power in this relationship between him and Blitz. He used Blitz as a pleasure toy, and it's called Ow. Solace, don't act like what we have is anything but you wanting me to fuck you, okay? You make that really clear all the time. But I just, I, I can't do it tonight, okay? I'm sorry. But then we get this song, and to put it out there, I like the song. It sounds good, it's performed greatly, and the visuals, while simple, are memorable. But I want to draw attention to some of the lyrics. And you walked in my room and like sparks in the dark light was suddenly thrilling and new. What's between you and I? Just a comfortable lie. I'm the fool who believes when you look in my eyes. Now, this right here can be both a good thing and a bad thing in the case of writing. The bad thing is that this comes off as though he doesn't realize that he had the power in the relationship that he had with Blitz. I mean, it's clearly obvious Stolas has the power in the relationship. Duh. And to that end, Stolas had genuine feelings for the imp, even though Stolas practically treated Blitz as a toy to get pegged. This to me should have been the moment that Stolas came to a realization, that you can still have these lines, but have him realize that he's perpetuating a power imbalance that he himself is a victim of. In this episode, we learn that Stolas didn't have friends. His life was dictated to him ever since he was a kid, and he was in a loveless marriage. He's obviously the victim of a power imbalance. Instead, behavior was built up inside of him, and he reflected on that power imbalance into his relationship with Blitz. And this is where I talk about how this can be a good thing, because since this is the only first episode of the season, you can still have Stolas learn from his mistakes and come to this realization in a later episode. It's clear that Stolas is going through quite an emotional time in his life, demon or not, and while I do stand that this should have been a moment of realization for him, there's also the context of the scene of this being the same night that Ozzy's when this happens. 
I mean, I assume it's the same night since Stoss is still wearing the same outfit as the previous episode, but what do I know? Also, I'd like to point out that this is the same guy who thought it'd be a good idea to call the imp you boned and your marriage to guard you while you have a father-daughter outing, and you decide to hit on said imp. So, my expectations of self-realization for the character aren't that high, especially on a night where he was hit with a lot of... EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! But, but, I'm trying to be charitable here. It's still the first episode of the season, and it's entirely possible that Stolas could come to this realization that his actions towards Blitz are a reflection of his own powerlessness to his family. Like, that's really the one of the better ways you can really make this character shine to me. And it'd actually be a really mature moment for the Owl to come to this realization. Whether or not he gets with Bliss after that self-actualization is another matter. But, sure. I could say it would have been nice to have seen something like this before the episode so it wasn't crammed down our throats, but hey, it's fine, I guess. Take what you can get. My other biggest gripe with this episode, and one that can't really be rectified, is selling Blitz into slavery to be Stolas' friend for a day. Now, getting aside that slavery is obviously wrong, that's not really my biggest issue here because, you know, demons, jackasses. What I find to be really hilarious is that the denizen of hell will say that humans are dumb when you got big brain moments like this. <laughs> no, no. No, the other one. Blitzow? Correct. How much? Uh, well, well, he's my son, so... Uh, mm, uh, how much you got in your pocket? A... Uh, water up five in a slim fit condom. Yeah, that's plenty. Twelve seconds later. Now listen carefully. You are being brought out to be his playmate. But I want you to steal as much from those rich fuckers as you possibly can. You could have asked for any amount and not have to worry about an owl demon catching your son and not getting anything out of that. Smooth. The only other aspect that I find is Blitz becoming Stolas' childhood friend. For a day. It doesn't really add all that much to the relationship, although I do question how Stolas could recognize Blitz with the new scars and about 25 years difference and drinking during the party that he meets Blitz. If anything, considering this is a toxic relationship in the future, it kind of makes this a little off-putting to me, especially since they were just friends for a single day and nothing came from it for 25 years till Blitz decided to steal the book and peg Stola so he can actually, you know, get the book. I don't know, there's just something really, really off right there to me. I think I want to cap this video off by saying that if you like the ship, it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with liking fiction like this. I mean, people like video games that are filled with violence, horror games that are filled with terrible imagery and situations, and the same can be said about relationships like these. If you like Owlboy and Imp here getting their freak on, I, I'm not gonna judge. I just don't like it. I'm merely looking at this relationship through the lens of a critical eye, since when it comes to relationships like these in writings, it's a tightrope that you have to walk on to make sure it doesn't come out as terrible. There was a lot more that I want to talk about in this video, but I want to be concise for once in my life, and I want to make it clear that I make these videos to express my opinions on the shows and what I hope to see. Of course, it's always possible that these elements in writing can work in a different way, and I only propose a single solution and analysis in this video. I mean, I could attempt to make a big video where I talk about a lot of different solutions, but not only do I not want to do that, it seem to be boring to me. That being said, I appreciate you guys giving me the time to watch this video and let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. I appreciate any and all support you can give my channel and just giving a comment helps as well. I'm Unga Common and uh, thanks for watching. Get the fuck out. You know, as an online critic, there are two things that I think are to be expected when you make videos, especially if those videos tend to be slightly negative and are based upon still continuing properties. The first is that you'll get some really dumb comments. Duh. The second is you're going to be wrong about topics every now and then, especially when you're a channel with a healthy amount of views, subs, and videos. Not everything is going to be a home run. Now, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. What I mean is, depending on how you level your criticism, as well as if the materials you're covering are complete or in progress, being proven wrong can be a good thing. Case in point, my last three Hell of a Boss videos were to analyze what information we had about the characters, I gave my impressions on said information, and gave my hopes on what could be done to improve the flaws that I had with the characters. As such, let's talk about the
about the latest episode. Hi, I'm Manga Kam, and nice to meet you. Well, I say we talk about the latest episode, but I really don't like talking about individual episodes anymore. I don't think doing a review of something that a majority of people have probably already seen is productive. I mean, what's the point of me giving my opinion on something that others can watch for free on YouTube and make their own judgment call? To me, there's nothing really to be gained from reviewing a show's single episode by single episode. And this is from someone who used to do that constantly. So today, we'll be doing this video a little differently. We'll look at the episode in retrospect and see if it does anything to my past three videos about this topic. If you'd like a refresher, I'll be providing links to said videos down below in the pinned comment or description. Or if this is a combination video as I tend to do, well, I'm sure you've already seen those videos up to this point. So let's begin then. Allow me to say this in the most eloquent way possible. Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. nothing. This episode doesn't do anything to my complaints and issues with Millie as a character. At best, we mostly get her as a straight man. And, uh, that's a comedy term for those who don't know it. It's basically where the character is to remain composed and has to deal with the comedy partner's eccentricities. In this case, Moxie, who has an obsession with art. At this point, I don't have any reason to attract any of my criticisms of Millie as a character. At best, we get a lovey-dovey scene of her and Moxie singing, but I already knew the two loved each other very much and could be a cute couple. Like, give me some new information. Moxie got more information about the character since he seems to be a man who enjoys supporting artists, which as an artist myself I can totally appreciate, but as a critic I find this to be vapid and, you know, kinda dumb. Whatever man, get the fuck out of here, you're cramping my business. But hey, whatever. Next! <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy, I'm talking about shipping again. Still lost in Blitz. We're getting back to mixed signals. Ugh. Now, before you type in the comments, I understand there's a perfectly good reason for this, but it's still something that we need to talk about. On stage is half as good as it is in bed. You'll leave them breathless. Flirting! Well, ain't that just peachy. Those who actually watched my video about Stolas and Blitz's relationship, you will know that one of my issues is the obvious toxic relationship, and it gives me the weird vibes. Especially when we're told and shown that it's very unhealthy. And even more so when there's a blatant falling out at the end of last season. Stolas, don't act like what we have is anything but you wanting me to fuck you, okay? You make that really clear all the time. Um... I just supposed to forget that Blitz took Stolas on a date only as a means to spy on Moxie and Millie's date and need to an escort to do so? Am I supposed to forget the episode before this one where Stolas was making that song expressing his emotions on how his love was a sham? Yes. There's no awkwardness between two characters, there's no tension, and it really comes off as jarring that the two are still being flirty between the two of them. Now, obviously, I know what your people are typing in the comments down below, which is weird because I haven't written this part of the script yet. You're gonna tell me, well, we're still waiting on part two of the season one finale. And that's all fine and dandy, and I understand that there's a reason for that. Bullshit copyright. But as a critic and someone who's watching this show, it's a bit of a big deal that there's a blatant missing part of the story. So I can't just assume whatever happens in that episode that we're missing will be adequate enough to elicit this behavior between the two. However, by that same token, I can't assume what's in it will not be good enough either. As a critic, I can't form an opinion on things that I haven't seen or played or whatever, so until this episode comes out, I can only judge the material I'm presented with. That's also a double-edged sword with materials that are still in development, because while we can't say this is done well or not, I am allowed to critique whatever is I have access to via the show. As it stands, without the show is being presented, there is no explanation as to why these two are essentially back to where they were before. I can only speculate that the two hash things out in some way, and that unfortunately leads to something worse. More speculation and raised expectations. So now, if this lost episode of sorts doesn't do it quite right, this is going to be an issue. Also, since we're here, I want to talk about two more things about Stolitz. The first is I got a lot of people tell me, yeah, the relationship is toxic, that's the point. You coulda fooled me. The show itself pushes the relationship. There's merchandise pushing the relationship. Quite a few people I've seen on social media push it. And even claim that it isn't no. toxic. Like, you can tell me the relationship being toxic is the point. No, duh, I get that. But I'll also see people defend the relationship and treat it as though it's actually healthy. Those are the type of people that if I bump into a dark alley, I'm running away! And this episode still pushes the relationship. So again, that missing episode better be so damn good it actually provides an antidote to this toxic toxic status. It's not impossible for the two to fix the relationship or remove the toxic status element from it, but it's gonna be a tall order. The second thing is, well, honestly I feel kinda of a little cheated here. 
we got this nice thumbnail of Octavia and Luna, and yet they only get like two minutes of interaction. Most of the episode is focused on the shit between Stolos and Blitz. Which, hey, if you like, more power to ya. But I wish we had more interaction between Luna and Octavia, especially since we had this gorgeous thumbnail artwork. Of course, I do have more of a substantive reason as to why I'm not too keen on this focus on Stolitz. <coughs> then again, I'm also not a fan of twig boy relationships, so sue me, I guess. Like, throughout the entirety of the first season till episode 7, the relationship is more of a sexual one and didn't connect with me. Again, I'm sure there'll be some sort of an attempt in the missing episode, but this leads up to a lot of expectations that could have been tied together. Speaking of... I think this is probably going to be the most positive I'll be about this episode, since a lot of it does help Luna's characterization and somewhat development. I say somewhat because... <laughs> But that's for another point. In this episode, we get a small sneak peek into Luna's past where Blitz adopts her. Obviously, this is looking to the terrible housing for young hellhounds where kennels are essentially prisons. I can appreciate the peek into Luna's past, as it gives us a look into Blitz and Luna's father-daughter relationship. And I ain't gonna lie, it did tug on my heartstrings a bit, but what does this make me want to do? It wants me to see more into Luna's past, like why was she even in the kennel in the first place? Was she there since she was a pup? Was she abandoned by her parents? Lots of questions, and it's fine to raise questions as it instills intrigue in the viewers, but my hope is that we at least get some semblance of these answers in the future. I will say this scene does make this one... Oh, I'm so sorry, I'll never replace you no matter what you... <laughs> ...a lot more bitter. Like, we've got this flashback where we see Luna on the verge of breaking down and being forced to live in a cage, and Blitz saves her from that. Then we get a heartfelt speech about how fathers screw up but still love their kids. And then Luna kicks Blitz in the groin. I get it's a joke, but even as a joke, it really comes off as jarring in a bad way. Like, I'm the first to laugh at jokes like these. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not taking the joke seriously, but as I've said numerous times, jokes aren't above criticism, as well as the placement of them. Like, you've got Luna explaining to Octavia that you should cut your father some slack. Then... <laughs> just leaves a sour taste in the mouth. And a joke like this can work, don't get me wrong, but it's the timing that makes it not really work for me, as well as how cruel it is. I'm not saying you need to have Luna accept Blitz's embrace, but having Luna sidestep the hug and Blitz crash into something like a street lamp or a sign would have had the joke work and not have Luna look like a crazy bitch. That's because it'd be more passive, showing that while Luna still has distance, she isn't going to try to actively hurt Blitz. You know, the guy that got her out of prison. And I get it. Demons. But there's just so much that excuse can be used, especially when you're showing that these demons have much more humanistic traits to them, such as empathy and caring for others. Which is why we should probably talk about the conversation between Luna and Octavia. Now, in a vacuum, I really like this conversation. I'm a huge sucker for things involving fathers. This sort of thing does hit a lot of key notes for a father who screwed up royally. Fathers tend to be viewed in a more positive light in families as they're typically seen as the protectors, the provider, and the heads of the households in a traditional sense. So, when they screw up, they can be seen as tarnished. The conversation that Luna gives is a good reminder that fathers are human too, and as such, they'll screw from time to time. Like, I've seen a couple complaints that Luna doesn't know Stolas enough or has the details of Octavia's situation, and to me, that's an understandable complaint. But sometimes advice like this can work well, regardless if you know the person well enough or not. Kind words can have an impact on someone regardless of context. Especially when it's the less of, people aren't perfect, even people you love. They'll make mistakes, and sometimes you need to accept that. I will say this conversation, when thrown together with what we've seen with Stolas, it really rubs me the wrong way, and I've seen said online that it seems like the plot is doing what it can to give him a pass for being a bad father. Now, we really haven't had that many scenes of Stolas even trying to make things up for Octavia, who is kind of a victim in all this. Saying that Stolas is trying falls a little flat because we've only gotten one example of Stolas trying to make things easier for Octavia during the divorce. And even then, he couldn't help himself but hit on the one guy he cheated on Stella with during that time. I guess what I'm saying is, if you want me to take what Luna says saying a bit more seriously as a whole, I would have liked there to be more context given. Like, Luna doesn't really know Stolas. The most that the show gives us is that she knows that her adoptive dad is being pegged by an owl demon. There's only one other one seen in the entire show with the characters in the same room, other than this episode. Hell, if you want my opinion, which, well, you're watching a video where I'm giving an opinion, you wouldn't be watching at this point if you didn't care what I had to say, now did you? In my humble opinion, I feel as though Luna should have found Octavia sooner in the episode, and have them basically trying to salvage some semblance of a good time. You can still have Blitz and Stolas' plotline, but you can also have Octavia and Luna meet up and actually establish a bond between the two. Maybe even have Luna at the start trying to get Octavia to come back to Stolas, but Octavia's being stubborn about wanting to see the stars. Hell, have the two complain about their fathers as they travel through LA, and that way Luna gets 
gets an idea of Stolas' character from Octavia's point of view, and Octavia can see that Luna understands where she's coming from with a terrible father. Then, when the two actually make it to the observatory, you can have that conversation where Luna tells Octavia that Stolas is trying. Grant, I'm not a writer on this show. I'm just a guy on it with a YouTube channel coming up with what I think could be a better piece of writing than this. And I'm sure there's some issues. I'm just giving my thoughts and opinions out there. I like the episode, but don't expect me to do this every time a new episode comes out. A lot of people have just asked me my opinion on this subject when the new episode dropped and I feel like I had to do it. I'm still reserving my judgment for this season for at least a few more episodes, and a lot of what I said here is also dependent on that missing episode. Knowing my luck, this missing episode will come out just after this video does, but we'll see how things will go! <sighs> I don't want people to think that I'm against this episode. I think it's a good step in the right direction for the show, but there are issues, and it really doesn't address my criticisms in my last three videos about this show. Hell, if I could argue, there are some other issues that do crop up because of it. So do I think I'm wrong about Alpha Boss? Uh, no, not really. I still enjoyed the episode. There were moments I really liked, and still at this point, I've had my say, and I'd like to know what you guys have to say down below. Was I proven wrong by this episode? Let me know in the comments down below. But if you don't know what to say for a comment, well, uh... Kick to the groin, I guess. <laughs> Till next time, my friends. I'm Common, and have a lovely day.